Today on the Perception in Action podcast, how exactly is peripheral vision used in sports? A look at gaze anchors and visual pivot points. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University and PerceptionAction.com. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. In today's episode, I want to look at some interesting new work examining gaze behavior in sports, in particular how athletes might use their peripheral vision. Throughout the podcast, I've emphasized the importance of gaze behavior. Whether we look at the quiet eye literature or research on anticipation, a consistent finding we see is that expert performers look in different places and at different times than less skilled performers. The nature of the difference seems to depend on the sport skill we're looking at. For self-paced, discrete movements like a golf putt or shooting, experts seem to use fewer fixations of longer durations when compared to novice athletes. That is, instead of looking all around the scene, they focus on a few key things. In other tasks, such as in team sports, experts seem to do the opposite. They use more fixations of shorter durations to a higher number of different locations when compared with novices. While novices get fixated on one thing, usually the ball, experts use more analytical visual search behavior. A point that I'm not going to get into today, but I've been trying to emphasize in a few of my recent Twitter posts, is that the expert gaze behavior cannot be learned by using generalized, out-of-context vision training. What an expert looks at, and when, is highly sport and task-specific, so it must be trained in context, in my opinion. But one of the things that has been missing from a lot of the gaze behavior research is the role of peripheral vision. In the work I've been describing so far, it is assumed that the expert athlete is moving their eyes to a particular location because the information in that location is important. In other words, they're trying to get their high acuity central or foveal vision on a particular location. But there are other situations in sports where the athlete can't really do this. One such situation is one that I wrote a blog post about a couple years ago now a baseball batter looking out at a pitcher waiting for the ball to be released. In this situation, the batter wants to have their eyes at the location in space where the ball will be released, the release point, so that they can pick up the flight of the ball as quickly as possible. But, as I discussed in the post, that is extremely difficult because until the ball is released, there's nothing at that point in space for the batter to lock their eyes on. So where should they look? Another example of a situation like this is a defender in basketball. When guarding someone, you need to look both at the person at the ball to pick up information which tells you whether they're going to drive, shoot, or pass, but also at other players on the floor, for example, to avoid being picked. So what one thing do you look at in this situation? Such situations raise the possibility that athletes may not always point their eyes at something that is important, but instead might do something different. That is, they might point our eyes in a certain location not because there's something important at that spot, but because it allows them to use peripheral vision to pick up other important things. This has been sometimes called the visual pivot point strategy or gaze anchoring. I'll get into that in a little more detail in a second. This is an idea I first discussed way back in episode 3 when I looked at the work of Ryu and colleagues. In these studies, the authors used a method called gaze contingent tracking. One of the things this allowed them to do was to occlude central vision of basketball players when making decisions about whether to pass or drive. So in other words, no matter where they looked, there would always be a black circle at the center of their vision. What they found was this didn't impair performance at all for experts, while novices were significantly impaired when they could not use central vision. In today's episode, I want to expand on this idea a little bit further by looking at a couple interesting recent articles by Christian Vader and colleagues. The first paper I want to look at is a systematic review currently impressed with the journal International Review of Sport and Exercise Psychology. In this paper, the authors specifically focus on previous research that has examined the functionality of peripheral vision in sports. In doing this, they found a total of 29 studies. In the paper, they look at research from a variety of different sports, from soccer and basketball to combat sports, and also compare and contrast the different methodologies used. But the most important contribution from this paper for me is their efforts to more clearly define and characterize the different strategies for using peripheral vision in sports. The authors identify three different gaze behavior strategies, the foveal spot, the gaze anchor, and the visual pivot point, that I would like to go into some detail now. 
In thinking about this, we need to consider the link between where we're looking and where we're attending. In most cases, these two things move together, what we call overt orienting. But it's also possible to have one's eyes pointing in one place and attention focused in another, called covert orienting. Think about a no-look pass in basketball or keeping your eyes on a speaker when you're in a boring meeting. The first category Vader et al. propose is the foveal spot. This is the traditional way we think of gaze behavior. That is, putting our high-resolution vision and attentional focus on some location in space so that we can process the information there better. In sports, the foveal spot gaze strategy is important in situations where there are only a very few number of areas that need to be seen in high detail, while information in the periphery does not. A good example of this is a football quarterback. As they move their eyes around, going through their progressions, for the most part, the purpose of this is to see the receiver and the defense in particular locations in high detail to make an appropriate decision about where to throw the ball. Information in their peripheral vision, in particular the defenders coming to sack them, does not really require high resolution because their movement can be picked up through the perception of motion, which is very good in our periphery. The second category is the gaze anchor strategy. To quote Vader et al., a gaze anchor would be defined as to the use of a rather long fixation on a position that is not necessarily related to an informative cue, as would be the case for the foveal spot, but that optimizes information processing via peripheral vision and eliminates the costs associated with saccadic eye movements. End quote. So this strategy is appropriate in a situation where there are multiple things an athlete wants to attend to that are separated in space and need to be seen with some degree of detail. By anchoring gaze in the middle of these things and shifting their attention around, the athlete achieves two things. First, the areas of interest are closer to the center of their vision than if they're using a foveal spot. Remember, our acuity falls off systematically as we move away from the center of our vision. So we can see things in the near periphery a little more clearly than in the far periphery. The second advantage is avoiding the saccadic cost the authors mention. Remember, when we shift our eyes from one location to another using a saccade, we are essentially blind while our eyes are moving, so we could miss a lot if we're jumping our eyes from place to place. Anchoring avoids this issue. A good example of a sports situation where this might be appropriate is the one I mentioned earlier with respect to the Ryu et al. studies, a basketball player deciding where to pass the ball. The final strategy is the visual pivot point. In this strategy, much like gaze anchoring, the performer fixates on a particular location not because there's useful specifying information there, but because it's a convenient spot for processing information in the periphery. So what's the difference between the two? As Vader et al. clearly explain, in gaze anchoring, the performer intends to keep their eyes still and shift their attention around covertly to nearby locations. While in the visual pivot point strategy, the performer intends to move their eyes from the current spot once the event unfolds. A good example of this is the one I discussed in my blog post I mentioned earlier. When a basketball player watches a pitcher's delivery, one strategy that seems to be used by some experts is to keep their eyes fixated on either the logo on the pitcher's hat or on their elbow during the first part of their delivery. The purpose of doing this is so that their eyes will be relatively close to the location of the release point and the batter can make a saccadic eye movement from the hat or the elbow to that spot once the ball is released. To quote the authors, a visual pivot may be a functional location to initiate saccades to peripheral cues and process information at the saccade's target location with high visual acuity, resulting in a number of fixation transitions from and to the pivot point. The second paper I want to look at is a recent one by Hossiger and colleagues. In this study, the authors look at the gaze anchoring strategy in a little more detail by studying martial arts athletes. In particular, they were interested in the question, what determines where a performer chooses to anchor their gaze? Previous research has found that martial arts experts anchor their gaze centrally on the head or upper body and use peripheral vision to react to attacks from the arms or legs as quickly as possible. Using this gaze anchoring strategy makes a lot of sense here due to the nature of the task. To quote the authors, In combat sports, if the athlete focuses on the opponent's attacking hand, he or she would probably be faster to defend the attack compared with a reaction that is based on peripherally processed information. However, in most situations, the next attacking location can hardly be anticipated. Therefore, one needs to choose either a gaze anchoring location in which the overall peripheral costs are minimized, or a location that best allows for jumping back and forth between potentially attacking limbs, end quote. 
So like I described above, this is a situation where the performer has multiple things they want to attend to and can't focus on just one thing. To address the issue of where the performer chooses to anchor their gaze, the authors made an interesting comparison between Kung Fu, in which attacks are made equally using both the arms and legs, and Taekwondo, where attacks are made mainly with the legs only. The basic prediction tested in the study was that the gaze anchoring point would be higher on the body for Kung Fu than for Taekwondo. To test this prediction and investigate how gaze anchoring evolves during the course of a match, the authors compared 10 Kung Fu athletes with 10 Taekwondo athletes. All of them competed regularly at the international level and had at least 5 years of experience. GoPro cameras and eye trackers were used to measure gaze behavior during a simulated match with the real opponent. This involved defending 24 attacks that occurred in a quasi-randomized order. What was found? As predicted, the Kung Fu athletes who had to defend both arm and leg attacks anchored their gaze about 35% higher on the body than the Taekwondo athletes. Without going into all the details, it was also found that the gaze anchor position changed as a function of time in the match. Quote, These findings support the interpretation that gaze anchoring height is dynamically adjusted in correspondence to the evolving situation. End quote. The authors concluded that gaze anchoring seems to depend on the evolving situation, the crucial cues, the specific cost of peripheral vision, and the suppression of information pickup during saccades. Overall, I think this is a really interesting analysis that could be applied to a lot of different sports. To sum up, our central vision and our attentional system are incredibly powerful in that they allow us to focus in on a small part of the world, see it in higher resolution, and pick up more detail. However, this comes at a cost. When we choose to fixate on a particular location, the rest of the world is of course going to be seen in much lower resolution. And if we want to shift our eyes to a new location, we're going to be blind during the eye movement. So again, how we choose to use our gaze is incredibly important in sports. In today's episode, we saw three different gaze strategies and how they related to the particular task demands of different sports. I think these are great examples of how we can better understand sports skills by knowing where the specifying information is located for the particular task. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at ShakyWings. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including an extra monthly episode and written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Yeah.